All right, we are in Second Timothy this morning. Second Timothy, and we're getting close to the end there. In Second Timothy, chapter four, almost done with the book of Second Timothy in chapter four, and we're going to do this morning, verse eleven and twelve. Uh, we've done part of eleven already, and we're not going to redo that this morning. And um, and so um, we're busy talking about, you know, this morning I'm going to, the, the, I've titled this message, The Prophet or Mark. Last week, which was, was the beloved, the beloved Luke and the profitable Mark. And so this, 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 um, this week we call our, we give our title this morning as The Profitable Believer. You know, identifying ourselves in this passage and seeing how we can be profitable too, like these men were in the scriptures. And so Paul, as we said before, as you read Second Timothy, Second Timothy, and you get through this whole book of Second Timothy, you come to the conclusion, it's, this is the last epistle that Paul writes. Paul is ready to be offered in the time of his departures at hand. He is going to die any time. He's the apostle that God sends to the Gentiles, and God progressively reveals to Paul the revelation of the, the, the mystery, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and Paul is getting ready to, 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 to depart and, and, and go to be with the Lord. And, um, and so and he's going to be killed for his faith. But in all this and all his ministry through life, you know what he says there? He says, verse 6 says, for I, am, for I am ready to be offered. In the time of my departure is at hand. He's ready for it. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So Paul says, you know, through all my life and what God has given me, you guess what? He says, I am ready. I'm ready and I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That means he's hold on. He didn't let go of that. And he kept preaching it and he kept standing for it. And he kept being su suffered, suffering for it. And he's going to die for it right now. And through all of this, he just, just maintained course and maintained what God has given him. And he's done that. Verse 8 says, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. There is a day that Paul is looking forward, he's looking for that day, he's, he's looking forward to his crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give him at that day. You know, and for all of us that love is appearing, we'll get that same crown, you know. And we, we thank the Lord for that. Then he says, as he's closing off with that, we've gone through all these verses. 9, he says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. He wants to see Timothy. He dearly desires to see Timothy. As you read that chapter 1 and chapter 2, he says, I'm desiring to see you. I'm mindful of your tears, Timothy. I'm mindful of the difficulties that you're going through. I'm mindful that, you, that, you, that there's some fear entering into you. I'm mindful of all these things. I'm desiring to see you, Timothy, because he refers to Timothy, he's not his biological son, but he refers to Timothy as my beloved son. You know, he's, you know and, and he's, 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 he's ministered to him, he's ministered alongside Timothy, and as he's now ready to depart, he wants to t have Timothy there, present with him, because Timothy also has a natural caring ministry. You know, it's good to have people around you that care. You know, not everybody cares. But it's good to have people around you that really cares for your well-being and care for your spiritual well-being and, and take care of the things. But Paul's focus here is not so much himself of like, I'm alone, please, please help me out in my aloneness. No, Paul wants to set last things in order concerning the work of the ministry that still has to go on after he's departing. His own main focus and all his focus in all his life is this, 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 this work that God has given him and, and, and this ministry that he has. And he's going to make sure that people get in, get in place and in, 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 in the right places and get, get the work done. He says, Do thy diligence to come unto me, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. We talked about Demas. And has departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. And we talked last week about Luke. We talked about the beloved physician that the beloved Luke, you know, and, and how he was with Paul right through the book of Acts, and how he sort of shipwrecks with, with Paul, and how he's in prison with, with Paul, and he's all these things, he's alongside his side all the time, and he's beloved, he's faithful, he's committed to the work, and we talked about him, and we're not going to do that this morning, I'm not going to go over that information again, he says, only Luke is with me, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry, and Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. 
So he says, now take Mark and bring him with thee. So please, he says to Timothy, take Mark and bring him with thee. And so last week we started looking at, 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 at Mark and we started looking at his... Um, um, but who was John Mark? And I'm not going to go through these details. You can listen to this message on Mark, what, uh, the intro to Mark, and last week's message. It's on YouTube. You can watch it there, okay? But we talked about uh, uh, John Mark and where he was. And, and Mark was there in the beginning of Acts chapter 12. And we know Mark is Barnabas' sister's son. Barnabas had a sister. And, 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 and his son was Mark. And Mark went with, Paul, went with Saul and Barnabas um, to the work, and, 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 and he went with Barnabas to Jerusalem, and with Saul and, with Saul and Barnabas to, Jerus uh, to Antioch from Jerusalem, because Mark was originally from, from Jerusalem. We talked about that last week. And then in Acts chapter 13, when Barnabas and Saul is sent out, and they, they send and commissioned out to go and do the work, and go to their ministry, and, and do these there's this travels and where they're going to establish churches and preach the gospel and go through that. John Mark went with them and went with him, but they, he wasn't with them all the way. He went to Cyprus, and when they landed Cyprus and they came to Pamphylia, when they came to the mainland, Mark is like, I'm out of here, I'm gone. And Mark went back to Jerusalem, not to Antioch, but he went back to Jerusalem where his family was. Okay? And then later on, John Mark and Barnabas and Saul had a contention. Barnabas and Paul had a contention concerning John Mark. Because Paul said, I, John, he went after, uh, here's the thing. I, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a, just the background here. So Paul starts off in Acts chapter 13. He's going out to these places. He's preaching, preaching Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of them, or preaching what he's known about the gospel that has been revealed to him. He's preaching the gospel of God's grace. In Acts uh, chapter 13, you have Bar Jesus that, that gets, you know, that tries to prevent Paul from preaching to the, 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 the Gentile um, um, there. And, and so Paul blinds him for a season, which is typical of the nation of Israel being blinding for a season and things like that. And so they, they go out there and they're going to go to the mainland. And when they get to the mainland and from that island, you know, Mark, that was who they had with them as their minister. This is Mark that he's talking about here in, in 2 Timothy that he says, now bring him to me, he's profitable. At that time, he wasn't profitable because Mark, when he had to go to the work, Mark says, I'm out of here. To the pack, to the, to the point that in, second, in, in Acts chapter 15, three chapters later, when Paul goes back, to, uh, he goes back to Jerusalem to meet with the saints there in chapter 15 and to deal with the issues of circumcision and the law and all these things going on concerning what Paul preaches and what the Twelve has preached and, and there's, there's, there's some of the things that's going on there. Paul says after that, that meeting in Jerusalem, he says, Let's go, he says to Barnabas, let's go back and go, let's visit all these churches that we've just established. And, and, and by the way, this established was not last week. This year is taking place in this travels, okay? Don't, you know. So he says, let's go to all these churches and visit them again and see how they do. Barnabas says, okay, let's take John Mark with us. Because now John Mark is in Jerusalem where they're back at. And Paul says, uh-uh, not taking John Mark with him. Why not, Paul? Because he left us. I'm not taking him with. He's not ready to come with us. Barnabas and then Paul and Barnabas got such a sharp contention about this issue that Paul says, okay, I'm going to take Silas and we're going to go. And Barnabas went back to Cyprus with, with Mark and they, they parted their ways. And there's a loss that we see of Barnabas in, that, in the book of Acts with, with John Mark. Okay. Then the next thing we find John Mark shows up as we saw last week. And I don't know if we did that. Did we do that? Because I don't remember. In my mind, I've preach this thing 20 times already, you know. Maybe you've never heard it. But, you know, next, the next thing we see John Mark showing up in the book of Colossians, in the book of Philemon. He shows up, and he's now suddenly, um, he's part of the ministry. He's part of what's going on there. And so in between Acts chapter 13 when he's left and Acts chapter 15 when Paul says, I'm not taking him with me, up to now with the first imprisonment of Paul, Something has happened to Mark where he's now profitable. He was not profitable before, now he's profitable. He's maybe got to a point where he just wanted to, this is too much for him, and I told you last week, which I think could have possibly happened. You know, possibly, I'm not saying it did happen. I'm not claiming it happened. I said there's possibly between Cyprus and the mainland, there's possibly been a shipwreck, because Paul talks about three shipwrecks. 
And only one is described in Scripture. And the one that's described in, scrip in Scripture is in Acts chapter 27. So there's a possibility in Acts chapter 13, as it goes from Cyprus through to the land, there was a shipwreck. And after that shipwreck, Timothy says, uh, not Timothy, John Mark says, this is too much for me. I cannot do it. Because Paul just gets on and he just goes on to the work. Tim Mark says, no. But something happened to Mark. You know, and he's now profitable. And sometimes, you know, as we said last week, sometimes you and I, you know, we're part of the ministry, we're part of the, we get excited about the doctrine, get excited about God's Word, and excited about our life as believers, and we want to, we want to be part of that, we want to do the work, we, and then it just becomes too much, or it gets, there's some things in the world that distract us, or our work, or our family, and we just get away from it, and, you know, it's been years that we've been gone away from the Word, gone away from the believers and fellowshipping with them, and just, and, and then you start feeling like, you know what, I miss that, I need that, I desperately need to be edified in God's Word, I desperately need to have God's Word profit me, and I think that's what happened to John Mark. John Mark then starts growing, and he possibly, Barnabas influenced him, as he was traveling with Barnabas now, and John Mark, is, uh, we find him in a, as a prophet. Well, let's go look at a couple of passages there. Go with me to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. This is Paul's first imprisonment. In Colossians chapter 4, he's mentioned there, and he's favorably mentioned there. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10. He says in verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus is all called justice. So suddenly this Marcus and this Mark shows up, and he is what Paul uses to the Colossian church to give commandments. It's the guy that was not profitable at that time, but now is profitable. He's now part of the ministry. He's actively evolved, and he's been used in the church, the body of Christ. And that tells me something, that sometimes you and I feel like, you know what, we deserted the ministry, we deserted the work of God, we deserted, but you know what, God's grace is always sufficient. God is faithful and He works in us, you know what, we can always come back and do the work and carry on with it. And go back with me if you will. Um, let's go look at another passage there concerning John Mark. And, oh, uh, not John Mark, but look at another example of somebody that was not profitable at one time, but now is profitable. Go, go with me to the book of Philemon. Philemon. The book of Philemon. Philemon was a minister in, the Colossian, in one of the churches at Colossia. He had a, he had a church in his house. And he had a group meeting in his house, and Philemon was actively involved in the ministry. And he had this servant that was working for him that left him. And it, it looks like, as you read the book of Philemon, that Onesimus, who was his servant, did him harm or caused him whatever he did. I am not sure whether he stole of him, whether he took things. Whatever the story, it doesn't matter. He just did not do the right thing by leaving, by leaving Philemon. So let's look at the book of Philemon, and let's look... Let's look at verse 10. It says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. That means he's begotten him in the bonds. I think what it is, is he's, he's fathered him as like a father to a son. He's taught him, he's admonished him, he's giving him the doctrine, he's giving him the teaching of God's word, and he's edified him as he's presenting him perfect in Christ Jesus so that he can go and do the work. So Paul knows this uh, uh, Onesimus, and he's, in, you know, by the way, you know what the word Onesimus mean? Anybody got an idea what the word Onesimus mean? Anybody? Profitable. Who said that? You got it written in your Bible, right? Okay. I beseech you for my son Onesimus. It means profitable, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. There's a time that sometimes in our lives we are unprofitable, but now we can be what? Profitable. We see from these guys. Whom I have sent again, that thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bells. Receive him as myself. Whom I have re retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without your, thy, thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should be not be not uh, should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps, verse 15, regarding Onesimus, Paul is writing to Philemon, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him for 
ever. Not now as a servant, but as above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Here's a guy that was a servant, but now Paul sends him back, and after Paul has ministered to him, he's begotten him, and he's, and he's, he's edified him, he's presented him perfect, he's doing all things, he sends him back, and he says, you go back to your master, what you, what you had, your master, but he's not just a master, he's a brother beloved. He's not your servant, but he's above a servant. He's your brother beloved. He's now profitable for you. And now use him and see him as that and receive him as that. And that tells me two things. Sometimes you and I can be like Onesimus. We do the wrong thing. We go off and what have you, but we learn. And we get edified and we can come back and be used. And then the other thing that sees me is when somebody has harmed me. And this is the problem, the problem with a lot of believers. A lot of believers in their lives, when somebody has harmed you, you can never forgive and never forget that person what they've done to you, and you will never ever have them in your presence again because you just made it up in your mind, I am gonna, that guy hurted me, he, he, he deserted me, and they cost me, or whatever, I will not have that guy back. But Paul's teaching, uh, teaching Philemon a very, very, very good message is to receive him as my own self. Forgive him. Because you know what's one of Satan's devices? You know what's one of Satan's devices? For you and I not to forgive. And we should not be ignorant of those devices. Because as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us, so should we. And so when somebody has hurt us and harmed us in the body of Christ, we should receive them. Even if they were outside of the body of Christ in that time and they get saved, then receive them. And forgive them for Christ's sake. Because God for Christ's sake hath... You know what? God the Father, God the Father have no choice to forgive us. Think about that for a second. God the Father have no choice to forgive us. Why? Because His Son paid for our sin. His Son paid for our sin. And to say, I can't forgive you because his, sin didn't, his, his death on the cross didn't pay for that sin. He has to forgive us for Christ's sake. Because Christ died for our sins. He died for my sins past. He died for my sins present. And He died for my sins I will commit tomorrow. He paid for all our sins, past, present, and future. I'm not hearing one amen. You guys don't believe me. He believes for all trespasses. He paid for all my trespasses. Past, present, and future. Onesimus trespassed. He did something wrong. He was unprofitable. Now he's profitable. Now he's edified. Now is the Word of God working in him. And so you and I, sometimes we feel that we're not profitable for the church, for the world, or anything like that. You know what? You get edified in the Word of God. You understand who you are in Christ. You learn about your identity and your my identity that we have in Christ Jesus and you become profitable. And your profit appears to many. Like Onesimus now can be profitable to the ministry. Like Mark is now profitable for the work. Amen? I mean, that, just gives, that gives me hope. Two things is i got to forgive and I need to allow that guy to come back and take that position. That's hard. It's hard. If somebody causes this ministry major harm and they walk out here and they suddenly come back a few, a few years back and say, oh, no, no, I'm so scared of you. I'm afraid of you because you caused a lot of problem. And so they're going to have to be checked whether they have redeemed themselves. Because sometimes when we do something, the only thing that, we, that fix us, our thinking about things is godly sorrow worketh repentance, not to be repented of. You know what Paul says there? If you godly sorrow, when you learn about the things that you've done wrong, and you, word, you read the Word in the, scripture of God, in the Scriptures, the Word of God, and it shows you and it reproves you and it corrects you, and you see it, and you have godly sorrow because the Word of God chastises you, it works in you, and it says, you should not have, I, I was wrong, I did that. And you repent of the change. You change your mind. What changes your mind? It's the Word of God that you're reading. And it changes your mind. And it just starts edifying you, the Word of God, as you read God's Word. And it builds you up. And it, and it tells you about who you are and how you're presented perfect. And now you can become profitable to the work. You guys follow what I'm saying here? I think it's fantastic. I'm like, ooh, man, this is great stuff, you know. That means, you know what? If I wronged you, you guys have to forgive me. 
If I wronged you, you have to receive me, especially if I showed progress. And guess what? I will wrong you sometime or the other. I will say something that will offend you one time or the other. And you will say something that will offend me one time or the other. I'm looking forward to the redemption of our bodies. I'm looking forward to my glory, should put in, for my mortality to put on immortality. I'm looking for this, this dirty or rotten, vile body of mine to put on a body like unto His glorious body. Okay? But I thank, him, I thank Him for His word every day, and I'm thanking Him for His faithfulness every day that helps me to deal with that stuff. So Mark has now become profitable. Onesimus is now profitable for the work. And it's the word that brings us to a point where the man of God can be profitable. It's the word of God that does that. You know? And that word of God is not something that you put an effort into. But it's something, you know, you don't, you don't become profitable because you decide you can spend, you're going to spend more time at church, more time at, at fellowships, more time at this, and now you're going to become profitable because you and your flesh thinks you're going to do all these things and become profitable. No, the only way that you and I become profitable to the work of God is for the Word of God to work in us, to be in us. A lot of people live their Christian life, if I can use that term, use their Christian life in a, on the basis of what they do for God and what they do for the church. Stop doing things for God and stop doing things for the church and start believing what God's Word is saying. Trust it, believe it, and as you trust it and believe it, it works in you and it produces a life where Christ is manifest and God manifests Him, not you. Christ is manifest, and He's doing the work, and God is faithful, and it's Him doing the good work, not you. Amen. People come to church and say, what can I do for the Lord? And then I ask, where are you reading? What are you studying currently? Where are you at with your understanding? Well, I don't know, you know, I just want to do something for God. Well, you want to do something for God, you get into that book, you start reading that book, and you start studying that book, and you start meditating upon it, and you start thinking upon it, because once you believe that, it works in you effectually. It pre you, you're in Philemon there. Are we still in Philemon? Look at that verse. I'm, I'm going to go to an old verse that I like to use. In, in the book of Philemon there, verse, um, verse 4, as Paul is writing to Philemon, he says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. God, Paul is thanking God for Philemon, always making mention of him in his prayers. Hearing of thy love and thy faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Now let me ask you, does, for me, for, uh, does Philemon have faith and love towards the Lord Jesus and to all the saints? Is it manifest? Yes, Paul talks about it. Look at verse 6. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. You see something, that, there's something in that verse that I think most of Christianity misses and don't get. That your life as a believer is not a life of what you do, but it's a life of what God is doing. Look at that verse. He says that the communication of your faith may become effectual. That word communication is not just what he talks. The communication of your faith is your whole life. What you manifest and what you say and what you do and, and all these things. The communication of your faith may become effectual. How will it become effectual? Well, let's look at the verse. By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. As we look at the Word of God, as we study the book of Romans, Robert talking about the book of Romans that they're studying, as you learn about your identity, you learn about your justification, how God has justified you by faith, and, and how He's identified and sanctified you, set you apart as holy, and you learn about your identification, that you're crucified with Christ, you're buried with Him, and you're risen with Him, and you learn to understand your life is not your own, it's His. It's no longer I that live it, but it's Christ. And you start acknowledging, by faith obviously, Every good thing that is in us, in Christ Jesus, what God has given us and, 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 and blessed us with in Christ Jesus, that is concerning His Son, because we're in Christ. This is what happens when you acknowledge that the communication of your faith becomes effectual. 
Do you get that? Look at another verse. Now I know some of you are like, oh, Des, you always go to this verse. I know I always go to this verse, but it's a good verse. It was a pretty important verse in my life. I almost want to claim it. But, you know, it's the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The communication of thy faith may become effectual by acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Where do we learn what good things are in Christ Jesus? Well, we read the Scriptures. We read Romans to Philemon and understand who we are. Understand where we fit in the God's program and God's plan. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, he says, You guys got that? I'm purposefully slowing down and not rushing through this. Some of you thank me and some of you are like, just get over it, let's get on with it. I'm going to go home and go eat. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this course also thank, God, thank we God without ceasing. Remember who he's writing to. Paul is writing to the Thessalonian church and those guys before they got saved were idol-worshipping heathens. That's who they were. Verse 13 says, For this course also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what? So when I said, Paul says, when I came to you and I preached the word of God to you, you did not receive this as my words, as a man's words telling you things. Most Christianity today functions on the basis of what the pastor says or the priests say or the whatever they want to call him, Father say, somebody text me this week, oh, Father Des, I'm like, call no man Father, please. And that's somebody from Africa, and that's just because there's a language barrier. I understand what he was doing, but I still had to uh, admonish him and, and, and tell him not to call me Father. My name is Desmond. Okay? But he says, when I came to you and I preached the Word of God, you did not receive it as my Word. You received it as God's Word, the Word of truth. And when you did that and you believed it, Something happened. He says, Receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that what? So that tells me when you receive God's word, and you don't receive it as my words, you receive it as God's word because you read it on the page, because God has given it to us now on the page. I don't have, a new, I don't have to have a New, Testament, uh, a new Testament prophet or a New Testament um, uh, somebody with knowledge that can tell me, oh, that is God's Word. No, I have it here in a book that God has preserved for me. And so as I read God's Word and I believe it, it says it effectually worketh in me that believes. It means, that word effectually, it means, it means God's purpose for His Word. The reason why He gave His Word is to accomplish something in the life of the believer, in the life of the church, in the life of the body of Christ. And as we acknowledge that truth, as we believe that truth, God is now working in us by the Holy Ghost in us, is taking God's Word and the living Word of God and works in us effectually. It produces what God wants to see it produce. It doesn't produce what the pastor wants you to do. It produces what God wants it to produce. And it's effective of work. Yeah. We, and you see this church. This guy went out in all Macedonia and the regions beyond preaching God's Word. Paul says, I don't even have to speak when I get it. You guys did it. Why? Because the Word of God effectually works in you that believe. And so if you want to be profitable and a profitable believer, the Word of God needs to work in us. In your mind, you need to spend less time at church because if you do coming to church because you think... And we'd like you to have you here by, the, by all means but if your mind if you're coming here because you're doing God's service forget about it stay home and go fish go ride your bicycle go ride your motorcycle do whatever you want to do because if you're here because it's the work of your flesh there's no profit in it although there should be the profit of one another appearing to you and you know that's another whole story but you understand what I'm saying but do it because of God's word working in you because you believe something. 
Not because you think you can do something for God, because none of us can do anything for God, because that's why Christ died for us, and why God has done everything for us, because God is faithful to help us to do that. Do you get where I'm going with this? In the book of Ecclesiastes, there's, a, there's a, one of the Ecclesiastes there in chapter 10. Go back here. Keep your hands there by Thessalonians, because we're going to get close back there. But I'll just read you that, that Ecclesiastes there. And if you go to Proverbs, go past Proverbs, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 10. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So that means if the iron is blunt, if you're busy axing something out there, and that wet means it's not sharpened, it's not shined, you can put so much effort into it. It's like, you know what? What's more profitable is wisdom. When you etch that thing and make it sharp, then you don't have to put all that effort into it. You just drop the axe and it slides through it. You understand what I'm saying? In the same way with God's Word, you don't have to put the effort in because the effort you're getting is going to be almost frivolous. What you need to put in is believe God's Word. Let Him sharpen you. Iron sharpeneth what? iron and so let God sharpen you by the wisdom of his word and appearing to all men and that sharpening of us becomes profitable to one another Paul says in Colossians 4 walk in wisdom to them that are without redeeming the time do not put the effort into it put the effort the effort we need to put in is making the decision to study to read to meditate to believe what God's word is saying I know in my life, I know personally in my own life, I've been, I've been around for a long time. I've been a believer for a long time. I got saved when I was 15 years old. In my late teens and early 20s, I was, I was, uh, I was doing what Robert was doing, the young man Robert sitting in the back there. I was a youth pastor and I was you know, Sunday school superintendent, and I was ministering and doing things. I was a deacon in the local church. I was doing all these things. But you know what? In all those years, I remember, you know, I was doing those things because it was expected of me to do it. Until one day I started learning about God's Word working in me effectually and understand that it's about Him doing the work, not me doing things for Him. I remember going to an old, an old brother that I used to, we have, every Friday afternoon we were divided up in the church, old Baptist church, we were divided up in the church and we had to go to... And then I went Uncle Eddie Murray. Uncle Eddie Murray was an old... He was in his 80s and he lived by himself. And I used to go there on Friday afternoons at 4 o'clock and I'd meet with Uncle Eddie Murray and then we prayed together. Which was a good thing. I got to pray. And I remember telling Uncle Eddie Murray, Uncle, Uncle Eddie, I, I, I just want to serve the Lord. I want to do what's right, but I find myself not doing what's right and I'm just struggling with this, man. Can you help me? And he says, ah, it'll be okay, it'll be fine, you know, you know, God will, you know, God will work it out, you know, and, you know, just, just keep on doing what you're doing, you know. And I wish at that time he would have said to me, just read the scriptures there, just believe the word of God, just get into the word of God, let it read it, and that will work in you. And I remember that frustration for many years, you know. Uncle Eddie Murray was a great guy, I loved Uncle Eddie Murray, he was a great, I, I really loved him. But I wish they would have given me the, you know, but it was later years that I came to understand, understand God's word. You see, now I'm talking about Uncle Eddie Murray and now I want to go to Afrikaans. It's weird. But you guys know what I said when I mean for the new guys, Afrikaans is my first language. English is my second language. I'm not speaking English very deliciously. So... <laughs> so, you know, so... Uh, but, but I wish he would have said, you know, there's just get into God's Word. But years later, I met, you know, get, I met some people that helped me to understand God's Word, especially rightly dividing God's Word. And then I started learning a few years after that about how God's Word works, how it effectually works in me. And it's by me having to read the Scriptures, believe the Scriptures, study it, meditate upon it. And as I'm doing that, then there's a God works in me by His Word. I use the old illustration, you know, you know, when you have an illustration of a, uh, of a car, I use this illustration, you've got a brand new car, you know, you've got to buy a brand new car, 
It's got just beautiful, it's all the latest technology in it. That car sits out there, out, you know, they deliver it off the truck, they roll it off the truck, they put it down there. And this car is beautiful, it's perfect. It's just everything that you ever wanted of a car, it's right there. But you get in that car and you turn the key and it's just, just goes, and they don't want to start. And then you learn, okay, that's before electric cars now, okay. Then you learn, there's no gas in the car. And so what you do is, everything in the car is designed for that car to run. But it needs gas inside of there. Now you pour gas in, you turn that key, the spark ignites that fuel. Which, what does it do? When it ex explodes in the, in the chamber, in a, in, a, in a cylinder, it pushes the cylinder down and pushes the other one down. And there's another spark that pushes that one down. And before you know it, you have this crank running, starting to roll. And when the crank's starting to roll, you're starting to have to get it engaged the, the, the transmission and it engaged the wheels. And now the thing is moving. But you need gas in it. In the same way, when you and I get saved, God places us in Christ Jesus. He gives us, He makes us perfect. He, 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 he imputes Christ's righteousness to me. And he, and, he, and he blesses me with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He makes me accepted in the beloved. He gives me all of those things. And I'm standing before Him complete in righteousness. But however, I'm struggling. And how do I live this? I have to learn who I am. And to learn who I am, I need to put the Word of God in me. And as I put the Word of God in me, the Holy Ghost ignites that fuel and explodes in me and it starts working in me. And I start, and I start walking in, in righteousness, not because I'm walking in it, but because God is working in me by His Word working in me. And I, become, and I start moving as a believer and I start becoming functional as a believer. And I'm profitable to all of you because of God's Word working in me now. You get what I'm saying? It's the Word of God that does that for us. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> and I know I'm not going to finish my message today. <laughs> but that's okay, isn't it? Don't say no. Or else I'll just keep on preaching till 2. It's okay, all right. First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. Verse 12. First Timothy chapter, chapter 4, verse 12. First Timothy, in Timotheus, verse 12. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 says, Let no man despise thy youth. Timothy was a young man. When he was a youth there, that means he, was, he could be up to the age of 35 years old. He was a young man compared to Paul. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. A lot to be said of those verses. A lot of us to take from those verses. Verse 30 says, Till I, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Give attention, attention to that. Verse 14 Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. He says, neglect not the gift that is in thee. In First Timothy, Paul is telling Tim, in the first book of First Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy, neglect not the gift of God that is in you. All the things that God has given you in Christ Jesus, don't neglect it. By Second Timothy, he's got to tell Timothy in Second Timothy chapter one, Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is in thee. Stir it up, because it's lying dormant, Timothy. You've got to stir it up. How are you going to do it? By giving attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Look at this verses here. He says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee, given thee by the proph uh, prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself holy to them, why? That thy profiting may appear to who? All. Ah, I'm learning something. When I'm giving attention to reading and exhortation and to doctrine, and I neglect not the gift of God that is in me, and I'm giving myself wholly to it, what God's Word is saying, I profit. And when I profit, my profit that God's doing in me prophet it appears to everybody can see you ever met somebody 
And like, there's something different about you. You used to be this lying, conniving thief. Nobody could trust you. You're just a, you're a rascal, you, you know, just... And Onesimus maybe was one of those guys, and then he comes back, and now he's profitable. And now people say, something different than you. What's different? He says, well, I got saved. I heard the gospel that Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again. I realized that I was, came short of the glory of God. I realized that, if, that you know, the wages of sin was death. I, I realized I was going to go to hell. But I learned that Christ died for my sin. And I trust that when God commended His love to me while, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I trust the gospel. I trust what Christ has given me. And I believe that the moment I believe that God take, took me and, and He placed me in His Son. And He sealed me and He gave me eternal life. And now that I have eternal life, guess what? Now I can become profitable. Something has changed in my life. I want to read God's Word. I want to look at God's Word. And when I'm leading and reading God's Word, it worked in me and it changed me. I didn't even try. God's doing this in me. And so my prophet becomes appearing to many. Other people can say, wow. And every one of us sitting here this morning, every one of us listening to this video, maybe on, you know, we don't get a lot of hits, but whoever listens to this, maybe you feel like you can't be profitable. Maybe you feel like you cannot just reach and attain to what, that, 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 that life that you think God wants you to be. You know what? It takes only belief and trust. Trust the gospel. If you're not saved, trust that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Believe it. Because when you do that, that very moment God takes you by His Spirit, and He takes you, and He moves you, and He places you by His Spirit into Christ Jesus, and He seals you unto the day of redemption, and He gives you the gift of eternal life. At that same moment, He imputes to you His righteousness. He makes you accepted in the beloved. He blesses you with all spiritual blessings. And nobody, nobody but anything in this world or every out there can take you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. You have eternal life forever. And God doesn't take back that He gives for free. And when you do that and you get then decide to go into God's Word and start to get into God's Word and let it work in you, you become profitable. First Timothy chapter 4 says, verse 16 says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That saving yourself is Timothy. He didn't say, Timothy, save yourself, because we can't save ourselves. But in this application here, the way we save ourselves is we save ourselves from this present evil world and by being taken away from what God has given us. It's not talking about eternal salvation. It's talking, and there's people around us that's living in this day and age in the world today that is beside themselves and they don't know how to deal with what's going on in this world, what's going on in this country. They don't want to deal with all the stuff, you know, uh, you know, especially 2020 and you see some of the stuff going on, the stuff they get fed on TV and, and from the news stations and people are beside, they don't have hope. They don't have peace. But you and I, when we profit from God's Word and God's Word is working in me, A base thing of this world. Because I don't consider myself commended among the brethren. Among the brethren. I'm a base. A foolish thing of this world. Which God has now worked in. And furnished. And I can become profitable. You can become profitable. All of us. Because God's working in us. And we save ourselves from, 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 the, the, from the ache and pain of insecurity. The aches and pains of no peace. Of being just tossed to and fro, save ourselves from just this world having the better of us. And when we save ourselves, guess what? We save others around us. Because as God works in us, I can share with you, hey brother, you know what? You don't have to do that. You can have the peace of God that passes all understanding. You can have the God of peace with you. And you can know it. You can know it like it's real. When you look outside of you, it doesn't look like it, but you know it in here. You know it in your heart. You know it in your inner man because He's given you the peace that does not make sense in this world. But He gives you that amidst of all this evil and all this mess. And you can still affect others around you that needs to be affected. Because everything that you do, you know, the fact is, you're my life. Your and my life, our lives as believers, are sermons. They are messages. What I do, what I say, how I behave, what I listen to, 
what I touch, what I, what I drink and what I eat, and all those things that I do is a message. People look at this. How much profit is, when people look at your life and the things that you and I do, how much profit is there for them looking at us? Well, there's a fine line. Don't try to live a life and be pretentious. You know, don't live with feigned faith, stuff that's not real. Believe the Word of God. Let it be the real deal. Why settle for a false thing when you have the real thing? And let the Word of God work in us. And our prophet can appear to all. And the way we do that is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to get finished here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And then one verse after that, and I'll be done for now this morning. I'll just basically finish off last week's message that I didn't get to finish today. Verse 14, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That's Paul writing to Timothy. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture, all means what? Okay is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, you and I, truly furnished unto all good works, the effectual working of God's word in our lives. How do we are we truly furnished? How are we profitable? By taking the profit of God's word as profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, and for instruction and in righteousness. Why? To present us perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And our profit becomes appears to many. All of scriptures. Read the word of God. Titus chapter three. Titus chapter three. Verse eight. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto what? Men. Maintain good works. How do you maintain good works? Maintaining good works is not a work of our flesh. Maintaining good works is maintaining reading, maintaining meditating, maintaining studying, maintaining setting our affection, maintaining being in God's Word. Because we've just learned that what works in us affectionately unto all good works is the Word of God. So to maintain good works, it's not like what I'm doing, it's what I believe. That's how you maintain good works. And that's how we become profitable to the church and profitable to the world out there. Amen? Paul says, to Timothy, bring Mark. He's profitable for the work. All these things Mark had to give attention to has changed. Onesimus is now doing that. Same thing. And Paul had to remind Timothy to stir up the gift of God that is in you. You beca became dormant, Timothy, to the point where you're ashamed of the gospel of Christ and ashamed of me, the prisoner. Don't be. Commend this thing to the Lord. Believe the word of God. Because that's what effectually going to affect you. And be your salvation. Amen? Father, we thank you for your grace. We're thankful for your word. We thank you for the prophet that's in your word. We thank you for your being faithful and that you are doing this work. And it's your word working in us effectually. We thank you for your all, all your wonderful and awesome grace that we don't deserve. We thank you for loving us. We thank you that that same love that you loved us with, that your son has showed in paying for our sin and giving us eternal life, that that same love can constrain us now and that, can be, that we can walk in that same love, pleasing unto you. Thank you for the profit that your word brings. Thank you that you can take mere mortal beings like us and you, God Almighty, can work in us by your Son and in the Spirit. So we pray these things by Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you, God.